Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Today we are here with Ms. Brenda Tharp and she is going to be talking about how to enhance your outdoor and travel photographs using Topaz plugins. Thanks for being here, Brenda. Well, thank you for having me. I'm just really delighted to have this opportunity to share some fun things that I do with Topaz products and you know, just have a good time playing around. Good. I'm excited to see it. So as you're looking at some of Brenda's images here, let me tell you just a little bit about her. Her career in photography has spanned over 30 years, doing everything from commercial and editorial assignments to stock and fine art. She wrote and photographed the book Creative Nature and Outdoor Photography, which was revised and released in March of 2010, and now has a new book coming out in August with her partner Jed Manwaring. It's titled Extraordinary Everyday Photography. She is an award-winning photographer, workshop instructor, tour leader, and an inspirational speaker. Her programs are presented to audiences around the country as well. And what I love about it, she's not only passionate about making images, but she really likes to and loves to share her joy of photography and help people find their own creativity to make better pictures. So that is what she's here to share with us today. And with that, Brenda, I will go ahead and turn the screen over to you. All right, great. Well, thank you again for having me. I'm delighted to be doing this webinar and sharing with you some of the things that I have found Topaz very useful for. And one of the things that happens when I teach my workshops is I'm often asked about workflow and image processing. Those are two very popular topics these days with uh, digital. And there's so many choices out there that many folks have difficulty deciding which way to go, which program to use. And there's a lot of good ones, but the one thing that I really like about Topaz is the fine control that you can have over your image processing. Topaz is especially useful if you're just beginning because it is easy to use and it's got a lot of presets so if you're not sure what direction you want to take something, you can just go down through the presets and play around. And I want to encourage you all, once you, whether you have the program or if you decide to buy the program, that you want to get in there and you really want to play. You just want to experiment and go through the presets and see what looks they give you and then start taking the step off from those. They're a great starting spot, but you want to take it from there and, and control the sliders on your own as, as well. It's also a great program for anybody that's already been processing or photographing digitally a while because, again, you have that fine, precise control over your images and you can get a unique look and a, a stylized look if you want it or just a good, really well-processed image result. So today, I'm going to cover some of the just detail and simplify. And if we've got some time, I'll get into using the new black and white effects program as well. So I want to now just take a few minutes because there's a lot of people in the webinar that may be new to the, the whole software uh, application of Topaz and I want to go through the interface. So I'm going to click on an image here and get that open in Photoshop. And on all of my images you're going to see uh, most of them, I should say, you'll see a layer where I have processed the image and I've just clicked that layer active so you can see the before and after effects. This is an image that I started with. It was in Bhutan. It was morning light. It was a little hazy. And because I also wanted to retain detail in the shadow areas of the house here, I wanted to overexpose my image slightly. I tend to expose to the right to get the most data I can in my, in my uh, sensor and that gives me more to work with when I'm processing the image. But the result is those pictures can look pretty flat. But this is what you can do with just a few quick adjustments in Topaz Adjust. So we're going to use that. I'm going to close that layer or throw that layer away and just get rid of that and then the whole thing there. And the thing that I do first in terms of workflow is on any image is I create a new layer. And on the Mac, it would be Command-J, and I 
think it's control J for the PC, but you can also go up and say new layer up in your, your toolbar up here at the top. So I have that layer. Now the other thing that I will often, in most cases, do is create a smart object out of that layer, a smart filter. And so we'll convert that right now, and I'll explain more about why I'm doing that a little later, but now we have this layer as a smart object, and I'm going to go up to the filters, and I'm going to go down here to Topaz Lab and to Topaz Adjust. So whether you've created a smart object or not, this is the way that you would get into the Topaz program. Okay? Now, we're in here, and this is the general interface that will be visible in detail and also in Simplify, very similar. So once you get comfortable with the interface in one of the applications, you can use that in the others and feel confident about where you're going and what you're doing. So just really brief, briefly, we'll go down the left-hand side. You'll see that you have a preview window up here in the top left. You have the ability to hide that if you don't need that. And then you have all the effects. You have a collection of effects, all of these collections, including one labeled My Collection, where you can save your own settings once you've gotten something to where you like it. And then you've got all these presets. And if you just start clicking on the presets, it will affect your image in all of these as you run down. You can use your up and down arrows, or you can just use your mouse and click on them. And this, again, is a good way to start. You can get to a spot where you might like where it's going, but you want to take it further, or you might want to tone that down a little bit. Now, a couple of key things to remember is that every time you open this program, it's going to have as a default the last thing that you did. So you want to come over to the lower right and make this part of your starting point is to reset all and get that image back to where it's the base level, where there's nothing else going on. And then when you start moving through your presets, you're clean. You just know that you've got a base level image to work with. So once I've done that, and I may choose a preset or not, you know, um, I then come over to the right-hand side. And when I get over to the right-hand side, you can see up in the upper right, you've got your navigate, and this is showing you where you are. You can also click on your histogram. This is a nice tool to have in here because as you're tweaking your image and making adjustments, you might go over the top and really clip your highlights or really clip your shadows. And so every once in a while, I will go back and forth and check the histogram to see what I've done to make sure that I haven't overcooked my image and created a problem where I'm blocking up in the highlights or the shadows and, and really losing something. But you know, more times than not, I'm just kind of bouncing back and forth between those. And then you have your different views here to increase the size of the image in your window if you want. And then you have this really nice feature called Snap. And you'll see here it captures a snapshot of the current settings. So if you've been working along for a while and you really like what you've got, you can create a snapshot. And when you do that, and then you continue on working, if you've really messed up and you think, you know what, I just need to go back to that level that I was happy and start fresh, you can just go back to that snapshot. And I'll show you how to do that in a few moments. And then you've got several flyout arrows here. And you can see one is global adjustments, another is local adjustments, and another one is finishing touches. Well, one of the really cool things about Topaz 5 is that you've got that local adjustments, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But in here, you'll see global adjustments of adaptive exposure, you'll see details, color, noise, and curve tools. Okay? And in each of these, you've got more selections. So at first glance, it might seem pretty complex, but once you get used to using the interface and you get really used to working with it, you just kind of know where you want to go, and you can flip around in between these different settings um, in different tabs and do what you want to do. So for this image, I might, for example, just so that you can see this in action, take this adaptive exposure up just a little bit. Adaptive exposure is essentially expanding the dynamic range of your image. Okay? It is adapting the exposure to the overall image. 
And so if I move this really extreme, you can see the effect on your screen that is really garish, okay? But you can see that it is, in fact, adjusting and adapting the exposure to the image. And I'm going to move it back down to right, probably around 0.26. Now, regions is dividing the picture up into however many regions you choose in this slider. And that is basically telling the application how many regions you want to affect in the image with the exposure control. So it's, the default here is at four, and as I go higher with this, it will be affecting more regions in the image. If I go lower, it's affecting less. And if I'm really down at the bottom, it's primarily just the highlights and the shadows, whereas here it's starting to affect more areas of the picture. And so I like it somewhere is probably around 10 or 11. And if I want to see where I am on this image, I can hit the space bar, and the space bar will show me the before and here's the after. So I've been building a little bit more contrast into this picture, just making it a little bit better, and you can see more detail coming out in that. You can also just click on the before and after in the upper left of your image window as well if you want to do that. So moving down a little bit here, I might drop the contrast, and contrast works a little bit differently in these programs. Um, and it's a little complicated to explain in a, in a webinar when we don't have enough time for all of the images that we want to work on. But the user guide is really helpful in explaining the, the effect that your contrast slider will have. So sometimes I'm lowering my contrast to make the image look better, and sometimes I'm going the other direction. So I'm going to bring my brightness down just a little bit here as well, and you can see Hopefully, sometimes the adjustments are pretty lightweight, so it's hard to know if you're going to see them on your end. And again, I'll hit my space bar, and wow, I'm getting somewhere. Now, that might be a little bit too heavy, so if I feel like it's too heavy after I've gone back and forth, I can adjust my sliders again. I'm not going to worry about it for this. This is not an image I want to spend a lot of time on. I just want to show the interface again for those that may be new to this whole process. And then you also have the ability to protect your highlights and to protect your shadows. And these little fly-out descriptions, the little yellow bar that you see, I'm going to turn those off here in a minute. But if you can't remember what it does, that is a way when you mouse over it, it's, it tells you what it does. This protects clipping uh, from clipping the highlights. Increasing the parameter will increase the range of highlights protected. Whew, good. I'm glad. So you can always go into the user manual and look at that. And an easy way to get in there is down in the very lower left, you'll see menu. OK, under menu, you've got all these different choices. And here's the user guide, OK? So but I'm going to go into preferences here. And I am going to close, shut off the enable tooltips so that we don't have that coming across our image all the time. And now we won't have that. All right. Now we also have a detail slider. So I can go ahead and just click on the details, and that will close the adaptive exposure panel automatically. And we've got other choices in here now. Now there is Topaz Detail as a standalone application that I like to use. And, and many times I'll use that rather than using the details in here, because I might want it to not affect some area of my image. And in this case, it's a global effect. But for this kind of image where I don't have a lot of blank spaces in the sky or a solid block of color that I have to worry about, I can go ahead and use this as an overall you know, detail adjustment. And as I really move this way up, you're going to see that suddenly now all the cloud fields have a tremendous amount of texture in them and quite a bit too much for my taste here. And so I'm going to bring that back down, probably somewhere around 130 or so, 1.3. OK? Now, the Detail Boost is a slider that will boost the finer details within this. So we've increased the strength of the details, but now we can also boost. And again, if I go extreme, you can see what happens. Now, you might like that in its personal choice, but it's a bit much for me. So, And I think probably most of you would agree. 
So I'm just going to bring that back down. And the boost is something that is really, you've got to use it carefully. If you're really trying to affect a natural look, which is generally what I'm doing here, you don't want to go too far with that to the right because it'll just look obvious. The goal for a realistic image is not to have somebody looking at it and saying, hey, you did something really weird with this image. You want it to just look good, but not have people trying to figure out what you did to get it there. And then we have a, slot, a, a tab here, process details independently. If you wanted to uh, be careful and not have your details affect some of your exposure and vice versa, you can click on this box. And if I click on this, I'm not sure you could see it or not. It's subtle. But in processing the details independently, it has smoothed out some of the details. It has separated those two. It's not really critical here. Having the detail show works for me in this image. Then you've got a color choice here. And you've got adaptive saturation, color region, saturation, saturation boost. And adaptive saturation is similar to adaptive exposure. It is going to adapt the saturation of the image. And as you move that slider up, and I'm going to go extreme again so that you can really see, now I've got it looking like the sun's just come up over the ridge, except the shadows aren't long enough. So you can't really cheat all that much and pretend it's sunrise, but this shows you how you know extreme you can get with the adaptive saturation. And so I'm going to keep that down just a little bit. And then you've got the regions. How many regions within the picture is this going to be affecting? And you can pull that up. And with such little adaptive saturation, you're not going to really see a whole lot of difference right now in that. But then you've got your regular saturation slider. And if I go up with that, you'll start to see the saturation. And the warmth that was in that morning light is coming back into my picture. So I'm pretty happy with that overall. You can either use the space bar or left click on your mouse and you can do the before and after. And you know it's it's a little extreme here, but again it's it's partly just to show you that so that you can see it on your screen where you can go from this to this and make that image more exciting. I got really lucky with this. We stopped to make this picture and we were excited enough about just the patchwork of farmland around it and then suddenly the guy walks out to take care of his ox and it just was a perfect little human interest thing to have in this picture so we were pretty excited about that. And so now we'll just go ahead and I'm going to skip over local adjustments at the moment. But the, um, what I can do is just show you that within it, you've got the ability to dodge and burn. And you've got the ability to brush out some of the effect or to smooth out some of the effect that you have created on the image. So this is now giving you the ability to selectively control an area. If I felt like my work was too much on the house, I could brush some of that out or I could smooth some of it out. And you've got brush size and opacity so you can really just apply a little bit at a time and not overdo it. And the hardness of your brush and then how aware your edge is um, to the scene so that you can have more precise control over things. And again, we're not going to need that now so I'm just going to not worry about that. Finishing touches is also really nice in that you've got different opportunities here too. And for this image, I could go if saturation was going a little too heavy and I wanted to warm it up a little bit but not oversaturate, I could go into warmth and I could just move that slider a little bit and it warms up the image but it didn't oversaturate everything in the picture. Okay, so that's another way that you can warm up and take some of that color cast away. And you've got borders, vignettes, you've got different options within here. You've also got a really wonderful opportunity here that if you feel like you've really done you know, a, a, an interesting effect, but maybe it's just a little too heavy and you don't want to have to go back and undo everything, you can work with your transparency, overall transparency slider. And as I go way up with this, I'm back to square one, okay? So if you just want to have, you know, to hedge your bets a little bit and adjust this before you've gone out of this, this image, then you are controlling the overall effects, all the adjustments you've made. You're just, you know, 
making the opacity on that a little bit less so that it's not as strong. So that's a great choice to have also in that. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and click out of here and cancel and not bother to save because I just wanted to show you the overall interface with that. And let's just get to having some fun with an image that we can do some good things with. Okay, so again, as a nature, travel, outdoor photographer, um, a lot of my images, I really like to keep those natural looking, but I want them to look better than they came out of the camera. <clears throat> and so this image here of an iceberg floating around in a bay of icebergs up in southeast Alaska, this actually I think might have been Glacier Bay. I lead tours in both areas, and after a while, one iceberg looks like another. You'll see that I have layer one here has topaz, topaz adjust five. If I turn that off, that's kind of what my image looked like coming out of Lightroom or out of Camera Raw without really any major adjustments other than maybe black or white point. So that's where I want to get to, okay? So we're going to turn that layer off, and I'm going to go to the background and Command-J to create a new layer, and I'm going to turn that into a smart object, and now we're going to come up to Filter, Topaz Labs, Topaz Adjust. And in this case, again, remembering to reset all because you want to be sure that you're back to your base level image as you're coming into this, I'm going to go in and work with the global adjustments. And again, the presets are there if you're not sure where to start. Some of them can really, you know, get you excited about the direction that you want to go. But I like to also control mine from the bottom up in many cases. And so I'm just going to start working with my sliders and bringing out some of the color and the detail. I'm going to bring this up to about 28 or so. And then I'm going to leave my regions probably about four, maybe bring it up a little bit. And let's see, on contrast here, I'm going to bring the contrast down just a little bit. And brightness, I'm going to bring that down a little bit as well. I want to hold some detail up in those clouds. And there's other ways to do some of that, but uh, just these basic adjustments here will help. And the highlights and shadows are okay. If I'm not sure about that, I can look at my histogram up in the upper right. And sure enough, I'm well within range here. So I'm not really going to have to worry as I make adjustments in this uh, image to really blowing out a highlight. So I'm going to come into strength now. I want to bring out some of the detail that's on the pocked surface of this iceberg from the rainwater and salt water as it erodes away at the ice. And so I want to come up and, and really bring out some of the detail in that. So if I go extreme, you'll see it on your computer screen probably. And that's really too much for me. Okay, but uh, that gives you the idea of what I'm doing is just bringing up my detail a little bit in there. And I'm going to bring up the detail boost just a little bit as well. So now we've got, again, the before and after. And that's already looking better in just what I've got going on there. Okay, so overall, <clears throat> that's working okay for me. But I still feel like the blue isn't there for the color that I remember these icebergs to be. And so I'm going to work with the color panel now, and I'm just going to start bringing up my adaptive saturation. I'll bring that up maybe to about 13 or so, and look at what it did right there. I'll slide that back down so you can see it. Okay. So it's that pale blue, but this is really more the blue that meets your eyes even more than that. And it's just, they're gorgeous, and I want to make sure that I'm bringing that out. So I'm going to bring my regions up a little bit on this. Okay. So again, from that to this, I'll keep doing that to sort of show you and to remind you how far we've gone, and also as a reminder to keep checking because you can go too far. You get caught up in this, and you're looking at it going, yeah, yeah, I love it, you know, and you're way out here, and you think, oh, oh man, that's great. Then you realize, 
that is really not great. So you've got to always kind of have a reference to, to what you want to do there. Let me get back to where this was and moving my saturation up just a little bit. And maybe the saturation boost up just a little bit as well. So in this image right here, we've gotten the color back in this area. We've gotten the detail on the clouds to still hold. And yet it's still a very natural looking image. Now, after looking at this, I might go back and say, you know, I need to make some adjustments here because I'm still I'm feeling that the overall Oops, grabbed and went the wrong direction with that. The overall is, there we go, not looking so good back here. My greens were too dark, and they shouldn't be black, and I wanted to pull out some color in there and pull out the color that was back in there. So by playing with these two sliders, I've readjusted some of that, and I really haven't affected this all that much, although there was an effect it still retains some of the color and that turquoise that I wanted in there. So in, again, in just a simple way, from this to this, by just using the adaptive, the global adjustments of adaptive exposure details and color, I was able to get a much improved image over what I had. And if I wanted to go in and do some local adjustments again, I could use that. Finishing touches, I don't really have a whole lot that I might want to do with this in particular. I might want to use the curve tool here. That's something that you can use within the program, or some people like to do it in Photoshop outside of Topaz, okay? You can grab onto the curve just like you can in Photoshop or Aperture or Lightroom and drag this around, or you can come up here and you can choose uh, one of the curves that's, that's already a preset, okay? And so you could go with light contrast. That added a little bit too much contrast back in, and it brought my greens on the hillside back to where it uh, is a little too heavy for me. And so I may just have to go back, and I can say lighter is going to be too much. So we go back to light contrast, and we just bring this slider up. Or if you find yourself really making a mess because you're just having trouble getting your fingers to control the fine details, you can always hit reset. And it will go back to what it was when you open this up. So if all else fails, that reset button is pretty nice. All right. So if I really loved what I had done here, and not that I don't, but I'm sure that with time I would work on this and make this even better than what I've got, I would say, you know what, for a lot of my Alaska iceberg pictures, I'm going to want to do similar things because I photograph a lot of them under cloudy conditions so you can see the color. So I'm going to save this. All the settings that I've done now, I can save. And I will make my own collection. And in the lower left, you'll see down at the bottom of the preset panel, you'll see Save. And this is a good time to do this. This is going to be Brenda's Iceberg Pictures. And don't mind my spelling or my upper lower case here. We're doing this quick. And I can say that it's good for nature and landscape. Is it good for anything else? Eh, you know, probably not architecture and buildings. I'm going to leave it as just good for nature and landscape in that category. I could type in here more details about what I did in terms of some of the choices to give me a rough idea, and I can say, okay, and now if I go up here to my collection, you will see Brenda's iceberg pictures. And now I can go to that, and I can click on it, and et voila, everything is back to where I had it. And so now the next iceberg picture I bring in, I could start with that preset of my own. All right, so we're going to cancel out of that and close this one now without saving here. All right, so let's do something that's got maybe a little bit more grunge and a little bit more pop. There was this cool door in Morocco. It was really awesome because it had been painted on probably a hundred times and the, the lock was so rusty and I really loved it. So here I did not do a smart filter, I just did topaz on a filter, but this is what I started with when I take off that adjustment 
And again, it's, you know, it's not a bad picture, but it's flat. It lacks some of that punch and the pop that I saw with my eyes. So I want to get back to this or close to it, and we're going to go do that right now. So I'm going to throw this layer away, and I'm going to do Command-J and make a new layer. I won't worry about doing the smart object right now. We'll go into Topaz, and we'll go into Topaz Adjust. And this time, let's hit Reset All, even though that looked pretty good. Uh, this time, I'm going to use one of the presets, okay? And after looking at a bunch of them, I looked at this image the other day, and I thought that it would be, let's see, let me make sure I'm in the right spot to remember my names here. Okay, Photopop, here we are, okay? Okay, so Photopop gave me a good starting point. Now I'm getting a bit more of that grungy detail coming out on the door, and yet it's not over the top, and the color was enhanced, as you can see here, by just going back and forth. I'm really on my way, but I'm going to take it further from there, and I'm going to come in, and I'm going to start playing a little bit more with my tools, okay? So I'm going to go to color right away here, and just jump in and say, I want to play around with saturation. All right, and I'm just going to bump that saturation up. This is in the village of Chef Shoen in the upper area of Morocco um, in the Rift Mountains. And they are known for their village being blue washed and white washed. And it's an incredible place to photograph. So there's just lots of blue stuff. And because they paint it all the time, you get all these incredible layers. So that's about the blue as I remembered it to, in my mind's eye. And again, it's artistic license anyway, so it doesn't really matter, but it's really improving from there, all right? And I'm pretty happy with that saturation. And now I'm going to go into details. And if I go into the details and I push the strength up just a little bit, you're going to start feeling the texture. Now I'm going to go a little bit extreme here so that it shows, and especially with the boost, okay? Now, I've gone pretty, whoa, pretty too far, huh? Okay, let's go back here, all right? So now, even there, with the detail boost up so high, is probably too much. I forget about the lag, and I let go, and it was still processing, so. All right, so I'm really liking where this picture has gotten to at this point. You've got all this wonderful rust and all of the detail that is in here showing, and I'm happy enough with this just the way it is. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And now we're back and we've got the image. And by the way, in the um, sometimes when you're at the 50% view in Topaz, it may not look as sharp to the eye. You can always go up to one-to-one -one if you want to just look at a certain area of the image. Um, but if you're trying to see the overall effect and you want to see the whole image, you'll keep that at 50%. But when you get back into Photoshop, you say, oh, wow, OK, yeah, it looks sharp. Everything's good. So now. Maybe I feel like I've gone a little too far. So you've got it on a layer, right? Because you've worked on the layer, you can adjust your opacity, and you can bring that opacity down. And if I bring it way down, I'm going back to the original image. But you've got the opportunity to correct it if, when getting back into Photoshop, you felt like it just got a little bit too heavy because you were having a good time and you weren't really paying attention. And so you've got that fine-tuning control just by adjusting opacity in Photoshop, all right? So again, I'm pretty happy with this one, and that was using the preset of Classic Photopop, which I find quite useful. It just adds a little punch, and it, it's a springboard for getting me closer to where I might want to go, and it saves me some time. And that's really what a lot of the presets will do, is save you time. Once you get to know the ones that you like, you can just go straight to those images, I mean, to those presets. And, um, and that will save you time. You'll get further along. And then it gives you more time to play in other areas if you've got your basics worked out. All right, so let's see. Oh, well, let's do this one. Now, this image, some of you may, have, may remember seeing the image 
it was on the cover of Photoshop User Magazine in April of 2010, I think it was. And I had done a selective sort of adjustment like this to it. And so this is what I did to the image, and this is what I started with. It was a full color photograph. This couple was wonderful. It was a great moment. Um, we were speaking in Spanish to them, and I happened to ask them how long they had been married. And in that moment, they looked at each other with this loving look that I just thought, oh, gosh, and I got one shot because it was very brief. So, and, and the color image was fine, but I just liked the, the feeling of more nostalgia and that, that look that I ended up with here. Okay? So, again, I'm going to just take and get rid of this layer. I think I grabbed the wrong, oh, I did this time, good. I'll just grab it in the wrong spot, and I'll turn this into a smart object this time and go up here to Topaz Labs and go into, where am I here, into Adjust. Okay. Now, from here, I'm going to start with the toned collection. And you can see in the tone collection, you've got all these. As I move my mouse down over this preset list, it's quite an array of choices, all right? I chose to start with, I chose Split Tone 1, and that really gave me the basics for where I was going with this image. And I was pretty happy with it just the way it was, but then I, you know, thought, well, I could probably do a little more work with this, and so I remember, if I can remember correctly, I did some adjustments where I'll leave my adaptive exposure and I went up a little bit more in my regions and affected some of the background areas a little bit more. I think I was up somewhere it's around 30 or 40, or 27, that'll do. It's different each time. I don't like to use a formula necessarily because uh, every day I feel a little different about an image. But I'm going to bring the brightness down on this because it's feeling a little hot. So I'm going to bring that down to around 17 or so, maybe too much. And these are all related. So sometimes when you've made adjustments up here and then you do an adjustment here, you might have to back up and, and correct some things. Now I'm going to protect my shadows because the shadows got a little heavy in there. So I'm going to just move this slider up and try to bring back some of the shadows and get that up and running. Okay, so that's looking better, just that alone. All right. Now, so I'm pretty happy overall with that look and the, the tonality of it. Okay, and then in finishing touches, there is a tab called Tone. All right. And these were the tones that were chosen for the preset split tone one that I chose over here on the left-hand side, all right? So you can, again, get in there and you can make changes to this as you wish. And so I was playing around with it and I found that I wanted to make a change. And so I made a change that was somewhere up in the 85 or so range, so of color two region. And then the color three region, I actually boosted that up to about 215 or so. Let's get up there. So here's the color image, which of course is going to look completely different when you're doing toning like this. But now we've got this. So that's what I did to make that image have that somewhat desaturated look on the background wood and everything and yet still have a subtle bit of color coming in the clothing and in the skin tones. So I'm pretty happy with that. I'll just say okay and that will put me back out and then you again will see the difference here. So it's amazing what you can do just with adjust. Okay. This is the before and after with detail, all right? And, and I'll show you why I want to use detail, all right? Now, I'm going to make this faster by just going in here, all right? It's going to analyze my image. I'm just clicking on the smart filter to get in here. It came over on my other screen. There we are. Okay. So now I'm going to do the small details, adjustments, everything is already here for me, okay? So 
what I wanted to talk about in detail, and again, these are not uh, basics of, um, in this webinar. I wanted to just show what I've been doing with my images, but small detail is going to affect very small details, maybe th you know two to three pixels um, at a time. And then medium detail is going to be larger, and then larger detail will be larger yet. So you really just start working with these sliders to bring out detail. And if you want to really bring out a super amount of detail, you could push that slider up. You're going to start to get a grittier look, perhaps, than you want as on the rock and in the grasses. It might look good at first, but you want to use it carefully. So here, I've gone to one-to-one -one just so that you could really see what I've done, especially here. I've gotten a bit gritty, I think, on the mountains. I want detail, but I don't want too much detail showing up in there. You know, so that it doesn't, we don't want fine lines like a pen and ink drawing around the edge. And so I definitely want to play with my adjustments to bring those details out, but not have them be too heavy. All right. So the medium details, if I go way up with this, it's starting to bring out some of the details in the trees a little bit more and some of the shadow details up on the mountains. And if I just bring this down into here, you can see in the water and in the rocks, okay, that I think that might be a little bit too much, and so I'll bring that down again. Because the foreground is really important in the image, more than the background in this case, and so I don't want to have the mountains looking good and suddenly realize my grasses are, like, really grungy looking. So you just work through these sliders until you get a feeling for what overall looks good. And you can, in, in detail, you can control, in, the, in this case, what's going on in the sky, okay? And I always get this backwards in my head, but here we go. With large details, which would be sky space and clouds, okay, I can really increase some of the contrast and increase the detail in the sky. You have to watch that you're not creating noise when you do this, but that is a detail adjustment that will help make your sky pop. And if I just bring this back down, you know, or, or, you know, really low, then it's not nearly as effective a sky as it is for me when it's up here. So again, I'm watching for noise in that case um, throughout the image, always, you know, paying attention to that. And then you can also make some adjustments in your sliders. And I'm sorry, my tabs in here are still on for this. But your, your cyan red, your magenta green, and your yellow blue are all going to affect the luminosity or the brightness of an image. OK, so let me go down to fit this on the screen here. So if I wanted to, um, let's say, if I wanted to lighten up the red, OK, you can see some changes. I'm lightening up the red. I'm lightening up the cyan. Where have I gone the other way here? So by making adjustments to this, all right, I can really bring out different hues or the luminosity of those hues, I should say, in the image, all right? And, you know, this, this takes some practice, this particular panel. It's tricky, and even I am still working on getting those adjustments just right in detail. But it's, you've got an incredible amount of power in this to be able to do that, and again, to still protect your highlights and your shadows in this. So here again, I've gone from this to this with more detail showing up and, you know, just really making that picture look stronger than when we started, okay? So I'm going to cancel out of this. If we have just a moment before we take questions, I wanted to just go in to simplify for a moment. Can we do that, Nicole? Absolutely. We had quite a few questions about that green flower, and I think you used simplify oh, this on one. that. Oh, yeah. The image started out as a composite of two photographs, one in focus and one out of focus, that created this glowing effect, the little halo that you can see around the flower here. And that is a, a technique that I use a lot. It's uh, 
what we called the Orton effect, named after Michael Orton, who developed this and really made it well known. And, and it's really great fun, and it softens things, it makes them dreamy. But I took that image and decided one day that I was going to go a little bit further with it and play with using Simplify. Because Topaz Simplify has that, gives you that ability to make paintings out of your photographs. And so that's what I did. So you can see here, if I turn that filter on, that layer on, that I've created a more painterly effect than this here. Okay? So we're going to, again, I'm going to just leave that layer turned off, and I'm going to go in here, and we'll go up to Topaz Labs and go to Simplify here. Okay. And reset all just to be sure that we're there. So this was the base image that was already a glowing halo effect. And then I said, you know what, I'm just going to put some watercolor on this and decided that the watercolor effect could be fun. Well, when I just clicked on the preset, I felt like it was too much for what I wanted. So I started with that, and then I started adjusting my sliders. And if you move the simplify size down to the left, okay, anything smaller than this number, okay, you'll see it's making a lot of different adjustments and I'm getting the detail back in my pistol and stamen area as opposed to when I was up higher which the preset had me quite high so I'm bringing this way down to where it's still giving me details but giving me a painterly effect all right so it'll be somewhere so let's say around there and if I wanted to bring some details in again feature boost it's like detail and the detail boost. You can bring some of the features back in and it will take effect when you let go. And if I really want to bring more features back in, I can do that. So now I maybe have a little too much feature, maybe not. You know, again, each time you do it, you decide a little differently what you like. So I'm just going to bring that back down a little bit. So here we have the without any painting done to it at all. And now we have the painting on it. And, and I do feel like my feature boost went a little high on that, so I'm going to move it down. And that's really all I did. I might have brought the brightness down a smidge on this, and I don't remember from time to time, but I can bring the brightness down a little bit and enhance the color at the same time, or I can just you know, leave it more like that. And I'm going to say, OK. I'm pretty happy with the painterly effect that I've got here. And now I, I've kept my, my adjust pre-adjusted layer off, okay? So now it's just this layer versus this one, right? But, you know, is it a photograph or is it a painting? And where you want to go with this is really personal. Let me go full screen here. So what you can do at this point and you could do this even on the smart object, you know, you can do this on any layer, you can adjust the opacity. So if I go way down, I'm getting back to pretty close to what the straight image looked like. If you want just a hint of a painterly effect, somewhere maybe around 60%, all right, now if I turn this off and on, I'm getting a painterly effect, but I'm still having it somewhat realistic. So it doesn't look like a cookie cutter preset approach where if you just use the preset on everything like this, all your pictures would look the same. You want to again start there and then tweak it for each image. Let the image speak to you because each photograph will have something a little different that it wants to have done to it. And that might sound a little heady, but that really is what it's about. You have to sit with the image, you have to look at them, and you have to decide what effect what is the image saying to you, and what effect do you want this image to have on other people? How can you make that happen with whatever program, whether it's Topaz, Simplify, Detail, or Adjust, or all three for that matter? So that was a really simple way to get a painterly effect on this. So I'm going to close out of that one. 
When I traveled to Morocco, I've been to Morocco twice, and, and it is just a riot of color, and, you know, they have all their stuff hanging outside of their shops and everything, and, and I love photographing all of this. And, you know, I, I've been doing this for years, and so as a straight image, you know, this is basically what I started with. So I could work this in Lightroom or Photoshop and get it to where I wanted it to be, with just basic, you know, controls and adjustments and have it be a very pictorial kind of image, more of a photojournalistic image in the real sense. Or I could take it a step further and again say, well, I kind of want to add a little painterly touch to this. Well, I've got two layers here. The first layer that I did, I went into Adjust, and we're not going to go back into that. I've spent plenty of time in Adjust. I love that program. It's so powerful. But here, I adjusted the adaptive exposure, the saturation, I moved a lot of those sliders around to get the image looking the way I wanted. And I also used the local adjustment area to open up the detail in the shadow area so that it wasn't just a dark black hole in there because that really felt heavy to me and it was central to the picture and I just didn't really like that it was detailless. I also knew that when I was going to apply Simplify and some painting technique, that reduces detail as well, that I might end up with a black solid space, and that wasn't going to work out. So when I was all done with Simplify and adjusting, this is the end result. It's a slightly painted effect, but still photographic looking to some degree. And so I did that in Simplify. And again, I started out with presets, and I had chosen the uh, painting oil. When it's done, you'll see that. Okay, so painting oil. Now it's pretty heavy looking here, all right? I went and made adjustments to my Simplify size, which again I can do for the purpose of showing here, and it takes a little bit of time to simplify the process, okay? But now I've really reduced the detail level in this picture by just moving it up to 0.4, and that is taking it a little too far for me, so I'm going to bring it back down to where I've got some realism and some painterly effect happening in there. And I moved my detail strength around and the feature boost a little bit and, and basically got it to where I liked this feeling as a painting, but I knew that I was going to want to combine that with my other image. So. I'm going to cancel out of this, all right? And again, folks, it's just really playing with the sliders and simplify in particular both the presets and the sliders to just give a painterly look to what you want. And I want you to notice here that my effect isn't as heavy. And the reason for that is you can see that I've adjusted my opacity up here in my layers palette to 56%, all right? And I'm going to go all the way up on 100%. So you can see the effect, which is basically the painting that you just saw in Simplify, right? But again, wanting to have that be just a touch of painterly effect, I'm going to just slide this down, and I let go now and then and just kind of sit with it and look and, and make the decision about where I want to go with this so that it has a painterly look, but it's not so obvious that it's a painting because you can now read things, you can see details, Everything looks kind of normal, but yet there's something a little different to it. So again, if I toggle this on and off, you'll see the real picture versus the simplified picture. And this really is personal choice. I'm not trying to be a painter, but I'm trying to create painterly effects with my photographs, and, and it awakens that artist within me. You know, I, uh, the latent artist that maybe always did want to do watercolors and oil paintings, and now I have that opportunity to play around with Topaz Simplify and really bring some of that out in the images that I've created. So I don't want to run yet further into this, and I know we've probably got lots of questions, so I'm happy to, to stop at this point and take questions, Nicole. Well, thank you so much for this. This has been really informative. Uh, lots of people with some great feedback. So I think just some of the little tips you've um, shown through your workflow are definitely appreciated. So that's good. But we do have tons of questions. Uh, so I'm going to start up at the beginning with, uh, at the beginning of your session, you were talking about 
overexposing whenever you were shooting that landscape image? Uh huh. Yes. And we had quite a few questions immediately about that. So Mark asked, doesn't overexposing give a real risk of blown highlights? And then following that up, Diane would like to know how many stops you're overexposing. Uh -huh. Both good questions. Um, it will depend on the situation, on the lighting, but typically when I got into digital and I started reading up on everything, I was hearing from a lot of the experienced professionals at that point that were in it longer than me that to get the most detail off of your image sensor, you wanted to expose to the right of middle, meaning that if you just took the camera meter reading that it told you and you made that picture and then you made another exposure that was slightly lighter, maybe a half a stop, maybe a full stop, pushing your exposure to the right so that your data on the histogram is farther to the right is going to give you more information to work with. And it has to do with the way the sensors are designed that you, you've got more information in the upper half of the sensor than you do in the lower half in terms of the numbers of pixels in each area. So if you really underexpose the picture and you try to lighten it up, anybody that's done that knows that if you really try to correct a big mistake of underexposure, you're going to bring up a lot of noise and a lot of problems because there's not that much information in the lower part of your, your uh, sensor. And the computer's having to create pixels to fill in, and that creates a bad look usually. So exposing to the right was something that just became sort of a habit. I always check my histogram to make sure that I'm not clipping the highlights. So yes, you do put yourself at risk. Now if you're doing travel photography and you're running around and you're capturing these moments that you're not going to get again, you have to really be careful about that. So I, don't, I know my cameras. I know that each of my cameras uh, actually gives me a better histogram, either slightly under or slightly overexposed in general. And then my gut just tells me to go a little bit further to get more information. And I always do a quick check on the histogram, even if I'm photographing a festival, to see if I'm you know, keeping within range. Now, because raw files also have a lot of, of latitude, you know, I know that if I'm slightly clipping my highlights, I know my cameras, and I know that I'm going to recover those highlights without any problem if it's a slight clip. If it's a big clipping, then I better pay better attention to my exposure and control that. All Did right. that answer both of those, I think? I think it does. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, there isn't really one or two stops. It's just going with the moment of, of light. Mm-hmm. Well, good. Uh, I think that answers Diane's question, too. Um, let's see here. The next question is about, I believe you mentioned some warmth within your travel photos, and Robin wants to know, for processing travel photos such as yours, um, do you generally suggest warming them up for more impact, or do you not suggest well, warming them up? Well, there again, it, it really is dependent on the image. If I really wanted to show the coolness of a morning in the shade, you know, um, I'm in Yosemite and I want it to feel cold, I'm not going to warm an image like that up. I, I actually might warm it up a little bit because I photograph in daylight balance, which means that what I see is what I get. So if it's a really deep shade blue light that I'm photographing under, then I'm going to get that deep blueness. And it might be too blue, and I want a feeling of coolness and you know, tranquility, but I don't want it that blue. So I may be warming it up. But um, it's really independent of the image. I use the warmth to enhance some of the, like in this case, the picture that's on the screen with the, the orange soda pop and the yellow jugs of probably cooking oil and the green and purple and blue plastic crates. You know, I, I want to warm up the image perhaps to create those, you know, to pop a little bit more, but not at the expense of the blues in this picture. So, you know, it's, it's really going to be dependent on the imagery. Okay, thank you. 
Let's see here. My friend Richard would love to see a portrait example. And I know you have a portrait of a man that we saw during the introduction. Maybe you could show us the uh, before and after. And he just wanted to see what you do with topaz on portraits. Well, I don't shoot portraits in the sense of like weddings and portraits. Mm -hmm. I don't do commercial portraits at all. So my portraits are really travel portraits. And so in this particular case, okay, this man from Morocco, this is what I started with. Um, and this is where I went with it using Topaz Adjust. And in this particular case, I used the light HDR smooth, I believe, when I did this. And then I adjusted the sliders from there. I wanted to bring out some of the detail in his face. And I can go in here and, and just show that. While you're in there, can you show the histogram in the top right while you work? Uh, just yeah. We had a couple of requests for that. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, and so in this one, all right, um, you <clears> – <throat> excuse me just a minute. The voice just completely went out. Um, what did I say? I was doing light HDR collection here. So um, we've reset all – okay. So – Light HDR smooth, where am I here? Oh, light pop. Okay, and that brought out the colors and it brought out some of the texture and so forth in his, you know, in the background and in his robe and his scarf and it also brought out some texture in his face. Now, I bring that up a little bit, you can see that better, okay? So we've got, this is before, you know, this is bringing out, it's evening out the exposure on his face a little bit, so I don't have as much of that, you know, glow on his nose and the, the oily face that we all have. It helped that out, and it also brought up that 5 o'clock shadow a little bit. But I might want to take that a little bit further, and if I did, then I could come in here and I could work on <clears throat> the overall detail strengthening. But... Here, it's going to affect the details everywhere. If I really wanted to bring out the details in his face more, I might choose to take this into Topaz Detail and really work on the size of the details that are going to affect his face. The other option is I could increase the strength of the details here, and let's just go up higher with that, so now we can see much more of the grittiness of, of his face. And if I feel like I've gone too far on the background or on some of the other areas, I could use the local adjustment brush to take and smooth that area out. Okay, So that's one of the ways that I work with doing portraits. But I'm not trying to smooth out skin tones and do a lot of the things that we do when we're doing commercial portraiture. So I'm not sure if that's helpful to him or not. He wrote in and said it was, so thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I, um, in this case, I wanted a gritty look, you know? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense for this image. Uh, let's see here. Quick question about, or maybe a couple questions about your overall workflow, not necessarily just your topaz workflow. Mm -hmm. Number one, you mentioned smart objects quite a bit, and that was probably our number one question. What is the benefit in your workflow for using smart filters, smart objects oh, or smart I'm filters? Oh, I'm so glad that was asked. I meant to mention that up in the beginning, and then you get off and running, and it's easy to forget. All right, so I'm going to cancel out of here, okay? The smart object allows me to get back to the adjustments that I did on an image, all right? If I created just another layer here, and I went in using this background copy, I went in and did an adjustment in Topaz, and I came back out again, when I look at it and say, oh, I, that was too heavy, I made a mistake, I've got to go correct it. If I try to go back in, okay, typically the habit was that I wouldn't be able to get back to where I was. Now, the features of last use settings is really nice. So if I just go in very quickly here to Topaz Adjust, and I'm going to do something just like totally bizarre to this dynamic brightness, okay, and I say okay, and I think, oh, gosh, how did I slip? I really made a mess out of that. Let me undo this so you can see it. That's horrible. I need to go back in and fix that, okay? If I go back in, and I hope I'm right in this, Nicole, in my memory, 
okay? Um, I go to last use settings. If I reset all and I go to last use settings, so now I can say, all right, I really overdid this. I didn't want dynamic brightness. I wanted dynamic pop instead, you know, or I wanted to adjust one of my settings over in the panels on the right. So, you know, that last use settings feature is really, really excellent. But I got in the habit of using smart filters in Photoshop so that I could always click on it and get back to the adjustments that I had made and not lose them. So that's why I use the smart filter or the smart object. Great. And another workflow question, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much for staying later with us. Oh, um, no problem. My pleasure. Let's see here. I've had quite a few questions about your general workflow within CS5 and what type of adjustments you tend to make before you go into Topaz. Well, I have been using Lightroom more than I use CS5. I'm using CS5 here because it's a very quick and easy interface for, and, and a lot of people are using Photoshop or Elements, so it's familiar. But um, I use Lightroom, and a lot of times what I'm doing in Lightroom, which would be the same in Adobe Camera Raw, would be adjusting for my white point and my black point. And, and making sure that if I've had a major clipping of my highlight or any clipping, that I'm going to recover that and get the image in, in sort of a base level to where I like it. I very often won't do any clarity or saturation adjustments or vibrance adjustments within Lightroom if I know I'm bringing it into Topaz because I've got that control within the Topaz programs. And so I don't want to overdo it by doing that stuff in Lightroom and then taking it in. Now, where I might do my adjustments of vibrance and clarity and you know, curves and so forth in Lightroom is if I then wanted to take it in to simplify and turn my created masterpiece into a further masterpiece of a painting now. You know? And that way, most of my adjustments are already in place, and I just have to put the painterly effect onto it that I want. So, you know, I'll do curves, and I'll do exposure, brightness, contrast, um, and, you know, clarity, and all of that in Lightroom, and then take it in to simplify. But if I know I'm coming in to adjust, it's really the bare minimum that I use Lightroom for. All right. Well, thank you again. That was perfect. I and mean, thank you so much for staying late with us. It gave everybody attending a lot of insight into your workflow, and I think that's what everybody really wanted. So, <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you folks hanging in with me, too, you know, and uh, it's, it's lots of good information, and there's never enough time to cover all the images that, that I've prepared for it, but I think that between what I showed in Adjust and then a little bit in detail and Simplify, you've got an idea of just how powerful these programs really are. And they're, they're essential tools for me. And they're on my laptop when I hit the road, and they're on the computer at home. And they're my go-to for a lot of things that I want to do with my images. So I just can't say enough about them. And the team over at Topaz has been very supportive and helpful. And I want to thank you again for inviting me to be a presenter here. And I hope we'll have you back in the near future. Absolutely. From the response we are getting, we'll definitely be having you back. So thank <laughs> you so much for agreeing to come and do this. And loved your imagery and love your workflow. And um, yes, everybody who's saying invite her back, I will be inviting her back. I promise. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again, everybody, and thank you, Brenda, and we'll be talking to you soon.